I like that, I like that a lot. Okay, um, the final uh, contribution tonight is from David. What we asked of, of David Weston to do was to give those of you who are making pitches and those of you who are going to go along to pitching tables uh, after he finishes speaking to some pause for thought, some ideas for, for, for how you're going to make this work well, not just make it happen. Okay, answer, so David Weston. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, a certain amount of pressure now of being a um, number of times Kevin has said, this is going to be brilliant, so I can pretty much only disappoint at this point. Um, so, uh, what I want to talk about, that's me, enough about that. What I want to talk about is why, um, why are we doing all this work? Why are we actually doing this work to try and improve what's going on in our classrooms? And it goes back to some fantastic research that shows that actually the quality of the teaching that goes on in our classrooms obviously makes every student achieve more in their lessons but actually is disproportionately beneficial for anyone who has had any learning issues. So actually the better we get, the more we help the ones we really want to help more. So actually those students we, uh, that are hard to reach are more sensitive to our improvement. So if that's not a reason to improve, I don't know what is. Um, now, obviously, what sort of improvement are we trying to get? And actually, um, we've, you know, people have really got to sort of the heart of this in some of the discussions um, today. And there is... The, dread, the dreaded O word, which has only been sort of mentioned uh, very briefly today, actually when someone comes in and just watches your lesson for half an hour, we know that what they're watching are the easy to see bits, that's kind of the stuff floating on top of our lesson. And all the really deep thinking that we've done, all the expertise we've built up, that's not necessarily obvious. And in fact, all the learning that's going on of 30 different learners, if someone's got a half an hour in our class, that's really hard for them to see. So actually, what we're thinking about doing here, and what everyone has been discussing, is the thought of actually, right, forget I want to be outstanding so that someone can watch me be outstanding. We're getting to, I want to develop that deep expertise that genuinely makes a difference, rather than just stuff that looks good. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, now, this is what I think successful change really needs. Um, and, and this is from just from a whole load of different theory uh, uh, and research and all sorts of things about what it really takes to actually make a significant difference. And, um, and I think, in a sense, a really good analogy for anything we're talking about here is imagine you're trying to learn a language and it's a similar sort of process that you have to think about for learning a new way of teaching or changing a way of teaching. So first of all, we have to have a motivation. And everything people have been talking about here are people who have been excited about doing something. And their incentives to do it is actually people are going to recognize them. The students are going to be really happy about it. They're going to get recognition from their peers. They're going to feel happy about themselves. They have to have those things. Everybody here has talked about the time they have to put aside for this. Now that really, that really requires focus and actually one of the things that um, in all the collaborations that have been going on here is thinking about I'm doing this and what am I not going to do instead? You know, because you can't do a hundred different things and actually one of the marks of the schools when you go into a school that's having trouble, they're trying to do a hundred things and there is never any lack of energy but it's being put into a hundred different directions and you can't learn a hundred languages at once. You have to do one at a time. Well, maybe two if you're doing you know, two languages, whatever. But it, you have to really focus. The next thing that's really interesting is you always need someone pulling you towards, this is how we found something that really worked somewhere else. And you want to try and make it as much like that as possible, but at the same time, you've got to make it work for you. And again, going back to our, theory, our language theory, then what we need to think about is, well, you need to make the language work for you. You can't just parrot other people's phrases but actually you'll learn the grammar that they're telling you, or you'll learn the words that they're telling you in terms of how you're teaching, but then you've got to make it work for you in your context, you know, develop your slang. You've got, to, you've got to make this work for you, but you've got to have attention. You can't just take an idea, ignore how it worked over there, and just completely change it and make it work for you, because you might lose the important bits. And you can't completely just copy an idea that works somewhere else. It's got to be attention. Uninterrupted time and space is a luxury, and if you're going to sit and have staff meetings, you know that you need to have those meetings where no student's going to come and knock on the door and ask you to check on their homework or something, and you have to have that time. Um, challenge, we've talked a lot about that, of actually people saying, I am not only going to come up with a new idea, I'm going to have someone who is potentially going to come and talk to me and say, yeah, you think you've got it, but you haven't. And we have to have that. Otherwise, if we're learning our language, we might be talking nonsense and someone needs to go, yeah, okay, I need to correct you. Very supportively, 
but they need to do that. We have to have a way of evaluating how successful we are being. And we have to know what we're trying to achieve and who we're trying to achieve it with and evaluate that successfully. And finally, when all goes wrong, we need someone to fall back on for support. And those are all the things that successful change needs and all your collaborative projects they need to build in. Um, I think the most important thing that you can do for all of this is really focus in on the ends and not the means. And as a teacher, we can get very excited about, I want to try this, I want to try that, I want to try using this method, I want to try using this gizmo, I want to try these things. And actually, that's the second thing you need to think about. And if that's what you've got in your mind, you need to go back and start thinking about exactly what is it that we're trying to address. Now, I've said issue here, and that's not supposed to be deficit, because we've already said this is a surplus model. And actually, this could be an area of learning you want to build on. But if you know in your head, right, I know exactly which learning issue I am trying to deal with here. I'm not trying to cover everything. I'm going to pick down one or two learning areas that I'm really interested in and then pick a group of very specific students so that you can see their faces so that when someone is talking to you about it and you are talking to your colleagues, you can bring that student to mind and say, ah, that's not actually going to work for Angelina, is it? Yeah, okay, you say that, and then suddenly it becomes tangible. Suddenly it becomes not just abstract, and this might work for our students. And the more specific you know what you're learning, you're trying to think about, and the more specific the students you're trying to think about, the better. So narrow down the scope of your project. It doesn't mean the benefits will be narrow, but it will help you really think about what you're doing and evaluate what you're doing. And when you're evaluating things, you can use a range of different things. And so, I, you know, I've got ideas here. You can have objective measures something almost effectively external to you that is measuring something and seeing, well, this is kind of outside my control and someone else is coming and doing something quite objectively here. And also your own judgments, and you need a combination of both. You need, for example, if you're trying to improve the way someone is reading, by all means, do reading tests. But you also want to do indirect things. You want to maybe measure how many reading books are taken out of the library. You know, so what are things directly you're trying to change? And then if you're really making a difference, what else might change as a result? And have a look at both of those things as you're thinking of what you're going to change. And think about some numbers and think about some descriptions. So if you can get a really good combination of all these things, then actually you're going to really deeply understand the change you're making and it's formative. As you're making these changes, you can go back and go, this is really interesting because for some reason the reading test scores are improving here but kids aren't taking more books out of the library. Now, that means we're not quite doing what we think we're doing here. Maybe we're just getting them better at tests and they're not actually getting the love of this. And it makes you think, hmm, okay, let's just go back and think again. Um, this is an approach that we use in the, in, in the trust. Um, and effectively, it's saying this is a great way of setting up a collaboration. And effectively, it's saying, right, I'm going to choose my inquiry goal. I'm going to think of what I'm going to try and do. And the first thing I'm going to do is actually say, right, this is what we're trying to change. If it's changing correctly, this, these will be the indicators. Now, with that in mind, let's kind of investigate, let's research, let's read the research, like all the blogs people were talking about, like the research, and let's think about what we're doing, and then try stuff out. But having done all that thinking first, you know exactly what should be changing, how you're going to check if it's changing, and you know where you started from. And it's all too easy to jump straight in without knowing where you started from. Um, as you're going through, it's a cycle. I love the lesson study model. If you haven't looked at lesson study, it's just brilliant. Uh, I'll do it on the next slide, actually. But it's a constant process of talking about it, trying something out, discussing it. How did it go? Refine it. Try again. Talk about it. Tr plan something else. And if every time you plan something you're going to do in all your collaborations, predict what you think the pupils are going to do, what your students will, how, how they'll react, and discuss why people made those predictions, and then observe what the students actually did, and then discuss why they were different or not. Powerful, really powerful learning. And then finish. Yes, you've got to say, did it work? Did the numbers change? You know, did our observations change? Yes, you need to write a summary and present it. Go one stage further, though. I challenge you to collaborate with colleagues when you finished and bring in completely different people who had nothing to do with your project and help them plan some lessons or plan some processes that used what you did. Don't just make it a, I'm standing up now and telling you what to do. Work with them and change your groups and get each person from your triad or your four or your five or whatever to work with some other people. And then they'll challenge you in new ways. It will deepen your learning and they'll help understand what they're doing as well. 
Um, I love, love lesson study. I think it ticks every single box. So effectively, it's what I've just said. You sit there. We often use triads. Don't have to. You plan a lesson together, and each time you say, right, we are trying to, say, improve reading of year eight boys who've had some issues before. Let's plan a lesson together, say I'm going to teach it, and my two colleagues are going to say, okay, well, first of all, David, you're going to try that. And I predict that, you know, um, Bobby is going to do that, whereas John, I think, is going to do this. And then having done that, because we're not trying to look at all 30 pupils at the same time, we'll pick a few examples, because otherwise you can't look at 30 kids at the same time. Then I'm going to teach the lesson. They're not looking at me quite specifically, they're not looking at me, and at no time will they ever say, outstanding, good, requires improvement. They never say that, because actually we're all looking at those pupils, and we all said, how are those pupils going to react? Did they react that way? Yes, no. Oh, that's really interesting. God, I can't wait to talk to my colleagues. Hey, look, he did something different, and no one else spotted it, and we're going to talk about it afterwards. And at no point is anyone looking, oh, but David, you did this. You moved to one side of the room, and you didn't use your body language correctly. You know, you didn't write your targets on the board, David. I'm sorry. Never get there. Great. Um, after the lesson, ideally, and this is a wonderful model again, as soon as the kids go out, you interview a few of those pupils and say, so tell me, we were just trying to improve this. How did that go? Um, and I mean, I've got a list of people who literally mentioned every single thing I'm talking about today in one of their projects. And then talk to each other and say, great, okay, so David, when you did this, and I saw Bobby did that, and then he talked to someone over there, and they said that, and I know we predicted this, and it sort of happened, but it sort of didn't. So what are we going to do next lesson? How do we address that? I love this model. It's absolutely brilliant. Implementation of all these exciting models, you can do two things. And, some of, and you're doing both, actually. Some people are saying, here are things no one has ever studied before. We're going to find something, and we're going to evaluate the effect of it, and then we're going to disseminate that out to the rest of the teaching profession. And we're starting here, and this is the start of something big. And others of you have said, I've seen something big that other teachers have done over there, say tolo, solo taxonomy or something, and we are going to try it here, and we're going to have conversations with them to say, but it didn't work for us, and how can we make it work for us, and we're going to contextualize it in our school. And it's taking innovation and getting it up and getting brilliant ideas and bringing it down. And that's what all these wonderful things can do. So, top tips. Decide why you're doing this. Why, why are you actually doing it, because you know, you're bored, probably not a great idea. Really think, what is it you're hoping to get out of it? You know, um, Who's going to benefit? Don't start anything saying, I want to do this, I want to use... Uh, um, there was a group of teachers I was working with, actually, who were desperately keen on using those little um, feedback pads. You know, the kind of, everyone has an electronic pad. And every single time, I was like, who is it going to benefit? Well, um, we're using the pads. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but who's going to benefit? Well, um, it's interactive. So, you know, everyone's like, no, 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 who's going to benefit? And it took us five or six times before they went, yeah, the quiet kids. Right, okay, let's look at the quiet kids. Who's going to benefit, how they'll benefit, and how you know? Start with that. You might have your exciting idea. Calm it down for a second and figure that question out. Decide what you're not going to do, because doing this takes time. So get your line manager to cut you some slack and say, that's fine, you don't have to do X, Y, or Z for a little while. Or someone's going to give you a bit more time and give you a few extra credit, a few extra cover credits or something so you can get time to do these sorts of things. Decide what you're not going to do now. Don't assume you can be heroic and do everything you normally do, because let's face it, you're all pretty busy. And then do this on top. So figure that out now. Dig in the theory and keep going back to it. And every single time something confuses you, go back to the theory, challenge the theoreticians, and, and keep doing that. Get yourself protected time. Beware groupthink. If a few of you are sat together and think you've come up with a brilliant idea, the more you talk to each other, you're probably going to gradually move together. Try and find someone awkward. I know you all know somebody awkward. Um, find an awkward person, the cynic who never believed you in the first place, and engage with them and say, hey, why is this nonsense? You know the reason you hate what we're doing. Why? Engage with them. Maybe someone who's had, a, who's had a bad experience with this. Maybe someone who's genuinely an expert and can actually go, yeah, yeah, I did all of this. Yeah, I went down that way. I realized it didn't work. Sorry. Do that. You need to get challenged and get some backup. Imagine what's going to happen when, in a few weeks' time, everything is hitting the fan and you've got too much other stuff going on and how are you going to get that backup and support? So those are my top tips of how you can make these collaborations that you're about to start talking about really well. Um, and then, yeah, we, I'm ignoring all of those things. We have a network, we have a database, we do exciting things. But I would love you to get in touch. The Teacher Development Trust, literally, is all about teacher-powered 
professional collaborative development that is sustained, that is evaluated, that is the, t the profession taking control of itself. And I took a break from teaching last year to set up this charity, and I've literally been sat to just sort of overjoyed as everybody is just saying all the things that I've been believing and you know Tom and Manny talking about joint practice development and Debbie talking about the underlying theory and incidentally Debbie after you did that David did our learning spy said great I want to talk to them about and they read my blogs and talking about getting feedback from students Athena Tom and Lexi and challenge is really good says Neil and observing each other and risk-taking says Hoi Yen and Philippa and let's have really specific outcomes says Diamond and let's start with the who and the what says Daniel and incidentally at, or during that tweeting Sue Cowley author of getting the buggers to behave when that sounds amazing this sounds like an incredible meeting great to see teachers sharing for the love of the job and the kids she says um, Carmela, you are identifying an issue you're passionate about. And by the way, I think you're on something really interesting there. Cover supervisors, massively under-researched area. Can I join in yours, please? Um, ped leaders, you know, you're talking about contagious distributed culture and bottom-up, and it's all these things. And everything that is brilliant about professional development has been talked about here today. And I am ap it is an absolute privilege to be here and witness it and be any part of it and support in any way I can. So thank you very much. And can I just say, I think an enormous round of applause for the people who've come up with this concept, which has just taken Teach Me to the next level. Brilliant. Thank you.